Well, good morning. Today we're jumping into a brand new series entitled The Mentor Series as we continue exploring seven distinguishing markers that identify a follower of Jesus. And so far we've looked into the life of Jesus, His mission, His character, His love, and His teachings. If you're joining us today for the first time or you'd like to revisit the previous messages, visit our website, hillcrestchurch.net, click on the word watch in the drop-down menu, and select past services. Well, in the Mentor Series, we're going to shift our focus as we delve into what it means not only to be a disciple, but a discipler, someone who is helping someone else to follow Jesus. And today, I'll be speaking to you on the power of encouragement. With all that's taking place in our world, we especially need to encourage one another these days. And my prayer for you is that you will be encouraged and to know that God is working in you, but also wants to work through you to touch the people in your world for eternity and for His glory. Let's start with a word of prayer together. Heavenly Father, thank You that You love us with an incredible everlasting love, and thank You that You sent Jesus for us, and Jesus, You sent the Holy Spirit to be the encourager in our lives. Holy Spirit, would You speak to us today as only You can and transform us from the inside out. We ask this in Your name. Amen. Well, who comes to mind when you hear the word mentor? Maybe your mom or your dad, a grandparent, an older sister or brother, maybe a pastor or a teacher, a coach or a friend, maybe your employer, someone along the way who has helped you, guided you, given you hope, served as a role model, invested in you, believed in you, prayed for you, pointed you toward Jesus challenged you to grow, made you feel supported, someone you are thankful for? Well, the longer we think about this question, the more people will probably start to remember. How many here had this person in mind? Anybody? Anybody have that person in mind? Well, unlike the Hollywood version, a mentor does not have to be the repository of all wisdom and knowledge. They just have to be someone you've come to know and trust and who is willing to pass on what he or she has learned. And that's what we're called to do as followers of Jesus. Jesus instructed His disciples to go into all the world and share the good news. And guess what? We can do that. You can do that. It doesn't matter how long you've been a follower. God can and wants to use you right where you are. Even if you're a brand new Christian, and even if you're a little green behind the ears. Did you catch that? <laughs> Punny. Okay, well, a Christian discipler or mentor is someone who says, I am helping someone and someone is helping me to be a reproducing follower of Jesus. I am helping someone, someone is helping me. That's how discipleship works. It's taking what Jesus has produced in my life and passing it on to others. Jesus commissioned His disciples and told them to wait for the Holy Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit arrived, the disciples were filled with God's power and presence, and then they went about doing what Jesus called them to do. You know, I feel tremendously thankful for the many individuals who have poured into my life who were willing to pass on what they had received from Jesus and from those He had placed in their lives. One of those individuals was Doreen Brogan, one of my Sunday school teachers as a child. Doreen passed away here this January at 88 years of age. What a wonderful woman of faith she was, with a smile that radiated God's love. As little kids, my brother Mike and I would attend her Sunday school class in the United Church. One of the earliest memories I have of her was in that uh, large sunlit area downstairs in the church singing songs like, Wide, Wide is the Ocean and Jesus Loves Me. Well, if there's anything that I knew for sure back then, it was that Mrs. Brogan loved Jesus, and Jesus loved me. Later, as a teenager, I went my own way, but when I finally surrendered my life to Christ as a 19-year-old, I began to attend the same church that Doreen and her husband Jim had begun to attend several years earlier. For much of his adult life, Jim had been an atheist and an alcoholic, but was led to Christ and healed of his addiction all at the same time. And for the next year or more, Jim and Doreen invested small amounts of time into my life, but those small investments 
investments had a huge impact on me. Through our conversations at church or when Jim invited me to attend full gospel businessmen dinners and we would share on the drive there and back what God was doing in our lives. Jim would often encourage me with his soft-spoken Scottish brogue to keep Jesus front and center. Jim was one of the elders in our church who eventually prayed over me and affirmed God's calling and direction. Well, that was more than 30 years ago. But their love and prayers and small acts of encouragement had a ripple effect in my life, and they passed on what they had learned. You see, there are many approaches to mentoring. The two that are most familiar to us are formal and informal. Informal is more relaxed and unstructured. It could be a one-off meeting at Starbucks or a meeting online to talk about, hey, how, how are things going? Formal might look like scheduling a meeting at the church office or a series of meetings or signing up for online coaching. These approaches are very helpful and are typically, typically led by a pastor or a seasoned ministry leader, instructor, or coach. I call these the top-down approaches because the mentor is typically older and has more training and life experience. But that's not the only kind of mentoring we benefit from. There's also reverse mentoring which is quite popular in the business world. I call this the bottom-up approach because the mentor is younger but more skilled and knowledgeable in a certain area. If you're an older business leader and you're selling to a younger generation, you're going to consult trusted advisors who are much younger than you are. How do parents learn to use Snapchat these days? From their 13-year-olds. A few years ago, we had teenagers out at seniors camp to show people in their 80s how to race RC cars which was a blast, by the way. Everyone had a fun time, and the young people who were there were the experts. Children and youth have much to offer us. They can inspire us by their faith and example and their passion for God. They have a lot to contribute, and God uses them to grow His church. Another approach to mentoring is peer mentoring. A friend of mine recently reminded me of this, how he and I are the same age, part of the same church, share much in common in terms of our families and our upbringing, and we're both called to serve God. He's a portfolio manager, I'm a pastor, yet each of us brings a unique skill set and a way of looking at things that encourages the other to walk this journey of faith together. Well, that's the way it should be, and I call this the side-by-side -side approach. A lot of mentoring takes place in the church this way. Then there's group mentoring, which can include all of the approaches. I've been in Bible studies where they've all taken place in that same gathering. So there are multiple ways for us to disciple and mentor one another in the church. That's how a discipleship works, a personal relationship with Christ, participating in a local church family, and pursuing spiritual growth. Proverbs 27, 17 says, as iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens the other. Whether you're mentoring or being mentored, we all get something out of it as God uses it to sharpen us spiritually. Well, when it comes right down to it, mentoring is all about encouraging. The word literally means to put in courage, to put into someone's heart the confidence, support, and hope that they need to keep going. I'm so very thankful for the way that this church family has rallied around Pastor Steve and Angela and Sarah and Michael during these very challenging days. The ways that you have shown love and support to them is beyond incredible. And in a sense, Pastor Steve is already receiving a form of heart surgery, spiritual and emotional, as God uses you to put in courage. Several years ago, I ran my first ever Spartan race, 14K, 25 obstacles, and 120 burpees. Because every time I failed to complete an obstacle, I had to drop and give them 20. So even though we raced individually, I was impressed with how participants would cheer each other on. Like when you uh, pass someone in the opposite direction, when you had to turn around and go the other way, you know, you'd, you'd give a high five or, a, or, or wave uh, to them. Or when someone uh, passed you on the trail, there'd be a shout out like, you know, good job, Spartan, keep going, right? More people pass me than I pass them, so, but, you know, got the encouragement. I think the most encouraging part for me was having Carrie and Julie and our friends there to cheer me on as I had to finish up slugging my way through the mud, under the barbed wire, over the burning logs of fire, and finally across the finish line. 
The encouragement meant so much to me at a time when I was physically and mentally drained. Well, many of us are here today and we're feeling drained. There are all kinds of pressures facing us today, whether it's finances or family, our marriages, our physical health, our mental well-being, and our kids' education. But God has given us the keys to winning the battle. The key, and I believe, is called the power of encouragement. And I believe it because the Bible teaches it. God says encouragement is a big deal. The New Testament word literally means to call beside. It's mostly translated as encourage or comfort, but can also mean exhort, to urge, to ask, beg, or plead. The noun paraklesis means encouragement, comfort, or consolation, which can come by way of support, rejoicing, instruction, or persuasion. The word parakletos means encourager, translated in our English Bibles as comforter, counselor, helper, or advocate. And this is the title reserved exclusively for the Holy Spirit and for Jesus. Four times in John's Gospel, Jesus refers to the Holy Spirit as the encourager. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commands. And I will ask the Father and he will give you another encourager to be with you, to help you and be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him for he lives with you and will be in you. Jesus promised us that the encourager would come and live in us. And that's very important to realize as a follower of Jesus, you have what it takes to encourage someone because you have who it takes, the Holy Spirit who lives in you. God is the source. He's the God who gives endurance and encouragement. We have encouragement from being united with Christ. The Bible says living in the fear of the Lord and encouraged by the Holy Spirit, the church increased in numbers. And that through the endurance taught in the Scriptures and the encouragement they provide, we might have hope. Our encouragement is found in God and in His Word. As Mrs. Brogan used to sing, read your Bible, pray every day, and you'll grow, grow, grow. But wait a minute, there's a third ingredient that's still missing here. There's God, there's God's Word, oh right, and there's God's people. God says we need each other. And it's not a recommendation for us, it's a command. In fact, we're instructed in the book of Hebrews to consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day of Christ's return approaching. The Holy Spirit lives in you if you have a relationship with Jesus, and He's working in you, but He also wants to work through you. And if that wasn't true, there'd be no need for this command. We could just sit at home with our Bibles and pray. But how does it feel today to be home, stuck at home and separated from your family? Not so good, right? We feel it in our society, but let me tell you, if we don't encourage one another as Christians, we're going to feel it in the church. And the church is the vehicle through which God is moving to change the world. In fact, it's so important we're called to encourage one another daily so that none of us may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. Even the Apostle Paul understood the power of encouragement. He wrote to the churches in Rome, he said, I long to see you so that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to make you strong. That is, he says, that you and I may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith. Notice that it wasn't enough for Paul to encourage someone else but that he himself needed the encouragement of other Christians to continue growing as a reproducing follower of Jesus. Though Paul had not yet been to Rome at this point, though he hadn't planted any churches there, he did have lots of connections. And if you read the end of his letter, Paul lists no less than 27 individuals by name, people that he was helping and people who were helping him. In fact, all three approaches to mentoring we spoke of earlier are listed right here. The top down, the bottom up, and the side to side. Paul has a, a spiritual mom here in this list. He has his first convert from Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey, who is now relocated here. And twice he specifically refers to co-workers. Encouraging someone is not rocket science. 
You don't need a PhD or to be a pastor or an apostle or read a thousand books of mentoring to encourage someone. Today, we're taking our cue from Barnabas. His real name was Joseph. He was a Levite, which means he was Jewish, and he was from the island of Cyprus, which means he was Greek-speaking. The apostles called him son of encouragement. Barnabas may have been his surname or a nickname because of the way he put courage into so many people, like when he sold a field and that he owned and brought the money to the apostles to support the work of the ministry. That, that was extremely encouraging. Barnabas was a tremendous encourager. The Bible says he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith. Barnabas would go on to encourage the Apostle Paul in ways that would greatly enrich Paul's life and bring glory to God. First of all, he chose to befriend. Barnabas saw a situation and a person in need, and he knew that he could help. Acts chapters 7 to 9 remind us that before Paul was this wonderful Christian we all know and love, he was a violent religious extremist who approved the killing of Christians. He went so far as to hunt Christians down outside of Jewish territory and bring them back and put them in prison. That is until he saw the light and he surrendered his life to Jesus Christ. Then he began preaching in Damascus in the name of Jesus, proving from the Scriptures that Jesus is the Messiah. The problem was everyone in Jerusalem was still afraid of him. But Barnabas intervened. He'd seen Paul in action and he knew he was someone that who could be trusted. Rather than stick to the shadows, Barnabas stepped out and he brought Paul and the apostles, the two sides, together. And because of this, Paul, who at the time went by his Jewish name, which was Saul, was now able to move about freely in Jerusalem and speak boldly in the name of the Lord. Barnabas, had he not intervened, the outcome of Saul's life and ministry would have, could have been vastly different. It reminds me that there are times when I am the answer to someone's prayer and someone is the answer to mine. No doubt Saul was praying for God to work in this situation, as were the apostles. Barnabas became God's answer to prayer. You and I become God's answer to prayer. It further reminds me that God has brought you and I here to Hillcrest for a purpose, not just for our own benefit, but to help shape someone else's life. Each one of you has spiritual gifts, heart, abilities, personality, and experiences in life that I don't have, in combinations that I don't have. You can speak into people's lives in ways and help them in ways that I cannot. God has people and a purpose for you. At the same time, it's not about your ability, but your availability. As we say yes to God, as we step in like Barnabas did, and put the courage in, it is God who transforms the heart. Secondly, Barnabas chose to invest in people. It wasn't long before Saul was sent away to his hometown of Tarsus because of strong opposition and threats on his life. Ironically, the persecution that Saul began during his pre-Christian days had now forced believers out of Jerusalem, but now some of them were traveling north and they went to the city of Antioch where their gospel work led to revival among the Greeks. The Bible says that the Lord's hand was with them and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. News of this reached the church in Jerusalem, so they sent Barnabas to them. When Barnabas arrived and he saw what the grace of God had done, he was glad and encouraged them all to remain true to the Lord with all their hearts. It was at this point Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul, and when he found him, brought him to Antioch. So for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. Despite the destruction Saul had caused during his pre-Christian days, God began to use him in some very powerful ways. Barnabas saw that in Damascus, and he witnessed that again in Jerusalem, and now he sees this need in Antioch, and he recognizes there's this great need. The harvest is plentiful, Jesus said, but the laborers are few. So what did Barnabas do? Well, he invested his time, his energy, and resources to go on a trip and look for Saul and convince him he needed to be there. Now, in our world of modern conveniences, we might lose sight of the fact that for Barnabas, this represented a 45-hour walk on foot in sandals, no less and a 700-meter elevation change. 
The guy's walking on foot through the mountains, hoping to maybe find Saul. And remember, it's not like he's using Google. And I'm sure he's praying the whole way there that God will confirm all this in Saul's heart as well. Because, you know, it'd be fairly disappointing to travel all that way, you know, for nothing. Barnabas was no expert, but he was an encourager. Willing to take time out of, like, a revival, time out of his work, his day and his week, when he could have stayed home or done the work himself. There were other men in the city who spoke Greek, men from the same island of Cyprus uh, where Barnabas was from. But stepping out in faith, Barnabas was obedient to God, and God blessed him for it. And it led to one more person stepping into the right place at the right time. The only way for ministry to continue expanding in our church, and really in any church, is if more people say yes to becoming encouragers and helping to meet the needs of others. When needs outstrip the number of encouragers, the reality is that some needs will go unmet. The church will only grow to the extent that we have people like Barnabas who are willing to invest in others. Thirdly, Barnabas chose to give credit to God. Give God the credit. By Acts chapter 13, we no longer hear Barnabas and Saul. We hear them, Barnabas and Saul, become Paul and Barnabas. In fact, there are two times as many references to Paul and Barnabas. Now, if this were a human endeavor, it would be understandable for Barnabas to complain. I mean, after all, he did discover Saul, and Saul, by his own admission in 1 Timothy chapter 1, was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man. Barnabas was none of that, and Barnabas was the first to be recognized by the Jerusalem church, and Barnabas was the one, the one, that the apostles sent to spearhead the work of the ministry to the Greeks at Antioch, to the Gentiles. And Barnabas was the one to find Saul 200 kilometers away and brought him back another 200 kilometers. And, and wasn't it the Holy Spirit himself who said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul to the work to which I have called them? I mean, who is this Paul character think he is anyways, challenging the words of the Holy Spirit? See, the only thing was, this was not a human endeavor. It was God's doing. Barnabas was simply an instrument in the hands of the Almighty, and so he urged others to do exactly what he and Paul were both doing already, which was continue in the grace of God. You see, it's not about us. And when it's not about us, we can celebrate when others succeed. Barnabas did. There was no room in his heart for jealousy, envy, or strife. When you choose to help someone, and as they grow as a result of what God has done through you, the end result should be that God gets the glory and you find your fit. You discover your place, your purpose in God's family and in His plan. And that is a beautiful thing that the world cannot offer. Befriend, invest, give God the credit. If you and I are willing to live this way, to be a discipler, to help someone else follow Jesus, God will accomplish great and wonderful things through your life, not because of your ability, but because of your availability. As a follower of Jesus, you have what it takes to encourage because you have who it takes, the Holy Spirit who lives in you. Well, today we have a testimony to share with you about the power of encouragement. Let's take a moment to listen as Lois and Alyssa share their story. Okay, so I'm here today with Lois and Alyssa, and they have been uh, in a mentoring relationship for the last uh, year here at Hillcrest Church. And so I'm going to just take a moment uh, to ask both of you how you've been encouraged by it. And so Lois, why don't you feel free to uh, begin and share from your heart? Okay. Um, well, I think mentoring is a great thing because I feel um, anytime you make an investment in someone's life, it's a rewarding thing. And uh, really, um, the blessings come back to me equally or even more um, than, than what I have invested. Um, Alyssa and I have uh, grown, I would say, from kind of a formal relationship to a friendship, and that's cool too. You gain a new friend. Um, it's been fun to watch her, her growth. I feel like 
um, it's humbling in the sense that God is allowing you to be part of what he's doing in someone else's life. And um, just to even um, watch her wrestle through things that she's struggling with and that we've prayed about together and see God answer those prayers. And all of that is encouraging to my own faith as well. Um, I feel uh, that mentoring is somewhat like a, um, a, a journey. If you're going to take a trip from here to Vancouver um, and had never been there, it would be very helpful to talk to someone who's been there who can tell you which uh, roads you should or shouldn't take or what sites you should absolutely see along the way. And, um, and, and I feel like that's kind of how it is with life. If we can glean um, from others' successes and failures, um, it's really a helpful thing. So hopefully um, what I've experienced in my life, and I have had more life experience, obviously, than Alyssa, um, that those things will help her along the way in her journey. Um, I feel, too, that um, it's not so much a... Um, teacher student type of relationship this is a journey that we're doing together so we're 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 equals and um, she inspires me to uh, dig deeper with her many <laughs> very good questions and some that maybe I've never considered before and and uh, even uh, my prayer life I just really um, want her to grow and and the things that she's challenged with in her life whether it's spiritual or otherwise um, i can be a support i can be a cheerleader and i can support her in prayer as well so um yeah i just think it's uh, uh, a great way to invest in people so great well, Alyssa? thanks thanks lois yeah. Alyssa, why don't you uh, share from your perspective how you've been encouraged it's been nice to have um, someone who's much more experienced than I am um, just kind of show me the ropes and like I tend to um, I tend to focus a lot on like knowledge and like theology and stuff like that uh, rather than relationship and faith sometimes so Lois like she always just brings me back to just having faith and trusting God and encouraging my relationship with him um, and yeah, she's, it's nice because she's someone that I can, it's a personal relationship. So she's someone that I can tell things that I don't want to tell other people. Um, and it's just, it's comfortable to be able to, um, to share that with someone um, who can lead me in a wiser way than maybe some people my age or, you know, other new Christians. It's nice to have somebody who's more experienced than me, who's been there and um, is able to kind of direct me a little bit, um, but also encourage me to turn to God about it rather than just speaking from um, whatever she thinks personally. She always encourages me to uh, go ask God about it and stuff. So, um, yeah, it's been pretty helpful. And she always brings me just, yeah, back down to the simplicity of just having faith in God. So, hmm. yeah. Well, that's fantastic. Well, I, I appreciate you taking time out of your day to share with, you know, your church family and those watching online about, uh, about your experience. And we pray that uh, it will be encouraging to those that are considering uh, mentoring or wanting to be mentored. Uh, in their walk with Jesus. And we're all, we're all on the same path. We're all walking this path together, but it's great to have a friend along the way to help you. And, and like you said, Lois, uh, <laughs> both people in the relationship get as much out of it, you know, as, as God wants them to, because, uh, because it's a blessing for both. So thank you so exactly. much for sharing today. Can I just add that um, a person shouldn't let um, the feelings of inadequacy ever stop you from from uh, doing something like mentoring. We don't do it because we have all the answers. We we do it in spite of. Um, and I, 
it's, it's, it's a journey. Like we, we never arrive in this life, so we're never going to have all the answers. Um, but you most likely have more answers than someone who's brand new to the faith. So um, use what God's already given you and um, you'll be blessed for it. Great, great advice. Thanks so much for your time. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Well, as Pastor, Pastor Ian reminded us last Sunday, to love others the way Jesus calls us to love them means stepping out in practical ways. So here are some options for us to consider. If you're looking to grow in your faith, learn how to better read or study the Bible for yourself, and do all of this in a safe and welcoming environment, I can think of no better option than one-on-one -on -one mentoring. So feel free to contact me, give me a call, or email me at mentoring at hillcrestchurch.net, and it would be great to talk with you. To do this, however, we will need people as well, like Lois, who are willing to say yes, and being on a list of mentors, and being available when the need arises. Uh, as the community life pastor, I will be involved in this process every step of the way to provide the support that is needed. And I have to say this is an incredible uh, thing for everyone that's involved with it. If you're interested uh, as well in developing a life or a Bible study group, but you don't know where to begin, again, give me a call or email me, uh, groups at hillcrestchurch.net. You might not be aware that everyone who is part of Hillcrest Church has free access to Right Now Media, which is, has more than 20,000 videos, Bible study videos, so books of the Bible, parenting, singleness, uh, business leadership, uh, all kinds. And it's a great tool for home, for kids, for personal study, for studying the Bible with friends and family. Check out our Right Now Media page on our church website and send us your email to get started. Right Now Media has also added a great new feature that allows you to and your friends to watch together virtually. So you can also have the chat and video functions available for that as well. The easiest way to start up a Bible study group, really, it's ask a few friends. Just ask a few friends. You know, someone says, I don't want to lead it. Well, co-lead it. Everybody lead it. Everybody pull together. It's, it's, it's about the journey. We're in this together. Everyone takes some ownership in it. Agree together on a day and time. Choose a Right Now Media study, real easy to do, and then just watch ahead on your own time. If you don't want to get together and watch the study together uh, and take time to do that, you can watch it on your own time and then get together as a group during the week to talk about it. Connect together, find out how everybody's doing, discuss what did God say to me in that, what does God want me to do, pray together. You could do 20, 30 minutes together, kind of catching up for the week, and it's a great way to continue to grow in your faith and encourage someone else. And finally, the easiest way to begin one-on-one uh, -on -one mentoring is just to contact me. Let's talk about it. Indicate a willingness to offer or receive mentoring, and I'll arrange with the mentor to make contact, and we provide the resources. Well, I want to just pray for you as we close today's service, so let's just do that together. Heavenly Father, I thank you uh, for all that you're doing in our lives through this season, and Jesus, for sending the Holy Spirit and Holy Spirit, thank you that you are working not just in me, but through me. You're working through us. And so thank you, Father God, that uh, it's not our ability, but our availability. And I just pray that, Lord, we would walk out of here encouraged and excited for what you're going to continue to do in our lives. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn His face towards you and give you His perfect peace in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless you. Have a great week. We'll see you soon.